This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is geologist, organic no-dig gardener, and soil food web specialist, Eddie Bailey. Eddie is passionate about soil health and growing healthy plants that are good for you and good for the planet. Want to know what the soil food web is? What inhabits the soil habitat? Why soil health impacts on plant health and ultimately our health? And what you can do to get the best out of your garden? Then listen on. So the soil food web, it's the community of microorganisms that live in the soil, but not just in the soil. They live in every compartment of every plant and on the plant itself. If you could sort of turn on a little video that could, or some kind of screen that could show these microorganisms, you wouldn't see the plant <laughs> or you wouldn't see us. In fact, the same with humans, we're covered in these um, bacterial and fungal and, and protist support network. I mean, they're helping us to live. They keep us healthy. They keep us alive. So the soil food web microorganism I'm talking about, bacteria and fungi are probably already well known about, you know, mycorrhizal fungi, people have, you know, that's into um, the sort of mainstream science, if you like, but it includes the protozoans and the nematodes and the microarthropods. And I use the analogy, I call it the soil Serengeti, because in people's mind's eye, they get the Serengeti, they can see the wildebeest and the zebra eating the grass, and that's effectively the billions of bacteria eating the organic matter in the soil. But in the Serengeti, you've got the cheetahs and the leopards at the next level up that eat the wildebeest and the zebras. And then at the next level up, you've got the lions and crocodiles. And everybody is sort of living together in a, in a lovely balance. And the ecosystem works. And if you've got all of those primary producers and various trophic levels, which just simply means who eats who <laughs> up the food chain, then Everything works as nature had intended and everything is healthy. Now, plants were effectively, in my opinion, looking at the the latest gene research, plants were invented by microorganisms for whatever purpose. I I, I think that they were looking to create a a stable climate, a kind of homeostasis on our planet for the good of, of later organisms. And they've been doing that for 450 million years uh, we come along and suddenly large swathes of our growing space have become depleted in nutrients crops don't grow very well they've become prone to disease and insect attack and yet you only have to look at a, a mature woodland next to a farmer's field no sprays no pesticides no synthetic fertilizers and they're they're producing an abundance of vegetative matter year after year after year. So that's telling you that something we're doing, we're doing wrong. And what we've done with those synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides is we're actually killing the cheetahs and the lions in the soil food web. And so the whole system, the ecosystem is breaking down and therefore the plants are no longer being supported as nature had intended. So the cheetahs and the leopards, those are the protozoans in the soil food web. So they're the next level up from the bacteria and they eat bacteria. The lions, as I see in my soil Serengeti, they are the nematodes and the crocodiles. And that's what's missing because when you dig the ground, you destroy the fungi. It doesn't help the protozoans or the nematodes either, but you start to spray with various biocides and insecticides. Well, you know, the only thing that's left at the end of the day is bacteria. Now, we know that farmers uh, have recognized that they need to put ammonium fertilizers on their land year after year. In many cases in conventional farming, they have to dress the fields with ammonium twice, three, even four times a year. The record I've come across is seven times a year. And you have to ask the question, well, hang on, where were plants getting their ammonium from? for the 450 million years until we came along. Well, when one organism eats another, they poop out ammonium. When fungi break down organic matter, they create ammonium. And it's that soil food web that has been producing the ammonium that we've now knocked out of the system. So 
what I'm trying to do is, is educate gardeners and growers and farmers to say, this is the basic science that I think it's actually quite easy to grasp the difficulty or the challenge or the great deal of fun, I have to say, is working with these microorganisms and putting them back. So is it sprays and soil management that is causing the issue? It's just that when you said about the farmer's field next to the woodland, I thought, yes, we are doing the things that kind of disrupt the soil food web, but also we are trying to grow plants that wouldn't naturally occur there. Is there an element of we're putting plants in that just aren't suited to the habitat or just aren't part of the ecosystem naturally? Is that also an issue? Absolutely. There are many things that we've done which the soil food web isn't a quick fix on. That's absolutely right. I'm working with Beth Chatters at the moment, helping them to become more self-sustaining with peat-free composts. And their motto, as you know, is right plant, right place. And yes, we're, we're trying to grow crops that really aren't suited to the ground conditions. If you look at heavy, wet clay soils versus sand and gravel, free-draining sand and gravel soils, the basic microbial organisms in those two different environments well they're slightly different yeah absolutely and i sort of teach that soil is a habitat as a key recognition you know you don't expect a polar bear to live in the serengeti it just wouldn't survive so yes there's absolutely an element of us trying to grow things where nature hadn't really developed that land for you know the plants that are there take gorse you know, down at River Cottage, there's this very, very free draining acidic soil based on the, the rocks underneath, the, the geology underneath. And if you leave it to its own devices, the gorse comes in. Well, the gorse comes in because the microorganisms that support the gorse are there in abundance and therefore the gorse grows. But you try and grow gorse down the hill slope where it's a, a much more alkaline, potassium rich, silty mudstone. Well, they don't go down the hillside. They stay in that environment because the microorganisms in the wetter, lower alkaline slopes, well, they're there designed to grow plants that like those conditions. So, yeah, I know you're absolutely right. But taking that just a step further, look at the F1 varieties. You know, we've produced seeds, carrots of a particular type, strawberries to enhance their red colour. And every time we do something like this, we knock out certain attributes that the plants need to call for these microorganisms that work with them. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm quite big into uh, heritage varieties that haven't been quite so affected by modern technology. Can you explain a little bit about what you do and how you help people in their gardens? Because I think that will touch on what it is that we need to be doing in order to make sure that we're growing in the best way possible for plants and for us. Right, yeah. So so one of the things that occurred to me through various meetings that I'd had with a number of people was that there was no face-to-face -face opportunities to talk and learn. You know, everything was online. And I've learned a lot of my things online and, and they're absolutely right. You know, I've done lots of courses online and yeah, there's questions you want to ask that occur to you in the moment. But of course, you can't ask them because you're looking at a recording. And so one of the big things that motivated me was to set up Rhizophilia was to do face to face. So what Rhizophilia, what we do at Rhizophilia is we have day long educational workshops face to face relatively small groups, maximum of, of eight, possibly 10 at a time. There are three basic workshops. If you go to our website, if you like, there's the theory science bit. We do a lot of hands-on doing the theory science bit. We go out into the kitchen garden and, and around the garden in general, looking at you know examples of, of good and bad soil food web situations. And that's looking at the soil as a habitat. And I think these workshops, this particular one, really does complement the RHS level ones and twos and threes, because I wouldn't claim to be the best plants person in the world by any stretch of the imagination. So I think we, we actually complement those kind of training courses. If you then want to measure the microorganisms, you know, you're starting to think about rehabilitating a damaged soil. Because in, in the first workshop, we invite people to bring their soil in or their compost in, and we put it under the microscope and say, well, there you go. 
let's compare this now to a healthy soil and and they see the difference usually they're a little bit surprised at how depleted their particular soils are biologically even in home gardens but especially on farmlands those that want to then go on and measure if you like in a sort of more sort of semi-professional way so we get lots of farmers and we've had quite a few customers from estates and rhs we then do a microscopy workshop a day-long microscopy that teaches people how to recognize these microorganisms and how to measure them and so they can they can sort of measure their improvements and then those that find that these microorganisms aren't at home well how do we get them back well that's all about good biological composting so we have a third workshop where we teach composting with the soil food web and the habitat in mind and how to inoculate with biological rich composts and extracts and that's all face to face here in Button Bassett we're just off the M4 motorway so right in the middle of the country so that was a that was a bit of luck to move here 30 years ago and be well supported by the traffic network and also you mentioned about inoculating the soil I did actually interview somebody who's making a probiotic for soil is that the sort of thing that you're looking at as well that's right. Yeah. Yeah. We've uh, we've sort of just started bringing uh, our own little product to the market because, again, from the various workshops that we've done and the customer feedback, there are quite a few people who haven't got access to be able to make good quality compost. So where do they get it from? And uh, so, yes, we're starting to produce. We're calling it kombucha. Uh, you've got your normal kombucha, the probiotic KOM butcher. We've called ours because it's made of compost, comp butcher, C-O-M-P butcher. Yeah, the probiotic for your soil. It's a, it's a spin-off from Rhizophilia Composting Workshops. It's called the Biocharged Compost Company. So yeah, we, we've just started. In fact, we had our very first, if you like, formal sale at a craft fair in Cumbria uh, at a place called Greystoke Castle just on Sunday. And their feedback was absolutely brilliant. So uh, yeah, looking forward to doing more of those. But I have to say, any, anybody doing these things, I, I'd encourage anybody to do these things because I think this is a, we're sort of in a sort of pioneering awakening of soil health. It doesn't just help your plants and your own personal health, but I mean, it, it's so critical for planetary health. So yeah, yeah the more people understand and, and get to grips with this, absolutely is going to be better for everybody. I met you at the Beth Chateau Symposium and you were really a proponent for growing food and growing your own food and thinking about kind of how the soil food web affects the food that you grow in terms of crops that we eat. Does it have an effect on the nutrient levels? Have you looked into that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. One of the one of the more sticky but enjoyable parts of the soil food web rhizophilia gardening and growing workshop is that um, we do refractometer tests uh handheld and digital on various foodstuffs and folia and it's quite eye-opening just how low the nutrient density is of your conventional produce whether it's strawberries tomatoes cucumber celery i mean the the results i get from celery and cucumber what can you say i mean celery there's fiber but it's water and I think actually it's fairly common knowledge that iceberg lettuces are the lowest of the low. They virtually have no nutrients in them at all. They've been so designed and so messed about with that there are no pathways biologically to make them nutrient dense. So they are just effectively leafy nitrates. It's just a real eye opener. And when I compare those to the crops that I grow, then, you know, it's chalk and cheese. My favorite example is the sweet corn that we grow. Obviously, I can only demonstrate this you know at the end of the season when they're all there looking bright and golden on the cobs but the bricks the bricks values of your shop produce might vary and i'll explain this a bit in a moment they might vary from say six to eight i think the highest measure i've had from a shop has been about 12 but my sweet corner up at 18 and 20 plus bricks value what that bricks value means it's a measure of the of the nutrient density that means the sugars but also the the vitamins the enzymes the amino acids that are in the the juice in the sap and basically what the bricks value is it's a measure of the degrees of refraction of light passing through that liquid and it's all relative to pure water so 
everyone knows that light bends when it goes into water. Well, the amount that the light bends when you say stir a little bit of sugar in, it's a more dense liquid. So the light bends a little bit more. So basically it's however many degrees it bends more than natural water is your bricks value. So a sweet corn that measures eight on the brick scale is just simply telling you that light is bending by eight degrees more. And over many, many years of experimentation and testing, there are tables that you can find on the internet. You can just Google, you know, what are the average bricks values of plants? And it'll show you tables that show you low nutrient value, uh, medium, high, and very high. And you can see where a certain vegetable fits into that picture. For sweet corn, something like eight to 12 degrees is kind of average. 18 degrees is up in the uh, good to very good category. I mean, I'm still wanting to get mine, you know, over 24, 25. I'm on this journey as well. So there's still plenty more that I can be doing. But yeah, that's Brooks values and nutrient density explained. And uh, yeah, to see what's in our supermarket shelves from conventional agriculture is eye opening. And it does make you wonder with all this sort of increase in illnesses across the world, it makes you wonder, well, just how malnourished do we not realize we are as a society? I remember interviewing someone a while back about the BRICS values and that was a few years back and it's not really gained much traction since then. Is anybody suspicious of the science behind that or is it just that it's not widely known yet? I think it's not widely known. I think that's part of it. But I do think there's an element of science. Wow. And I think that's why our workshops work quite well because it's a face-to-face and it gives you the opportunity to really, in these small groups that we do, really help those that may be a little bit sceptical or, you know, it just helps them to sort of understand bit by bit how this science is, is working. And putting it into, you know, simple analogies that people understand. One of the things that I've noticed a number of times from the feedback I get from my workshops is the customers, the clients are guests, I like to see them as. They look at me a little bit quizzically and I say to them, does that make sense? And they look at me and go, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does make sense. Uh, But I don't know why, because this is turning things that I've learned upside down. And I said, well, that sense that you're feeling, I said, I just, I don't know. But is that some kind of ancestral knowledge that we've all got? You know, you see a red berry and you go, oh, I'm not going to eat that. It's a red berry. Why? How, How do you know that? That's ancestral knowledge. You know, there's certain things we do still. You know, you see a wasp, black and yellow, and you, you back off from it. It doesn't matter if you've never seen a wasp in your life. If you're a, a child and you've never seen it, you back off from these kind of things. Well, I think that that ancestral knowledge of what's right for us in terms of food stuff and, and you know, taste and smell, yeah, I think we can sense that. So Brick's values is just one way of measuring that and 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 putting a number to it but when you explain the science behind it i think people get it it's just that explanation that's needed and it isn't really happening again exactly why i set up rhizophilia to try and make those connections with gardeners and growers if you could leave people who are listening with you know one thing you could do off the back of listening to this or one thing you could go and research what advice would you give or how would you inspire people i would say you know we, we have to get back to the real basics of what's going on here and that is soil is a habitat and these microorganisms they practically invented plants and they've been supporting and growing them ever since 450 million years and look what they've produced you know the wonderful coniferous forests the grain forests the prairies you know angiosperms beautiful flowers i mean they know what they're doing we just need to simply get back to nature if anything that our workshops do it tries to simplify things and say, well, this is how it should be. Let's get back to nature. That sounds a fairly sort of bland statement, but when you understand the science, and that's what I give people these toolboxes so they can take that science to wherever they're living and make it happen where they are. So yeah, soil is a habitat. And let's understand what these microorganisms have done. And they, and they do the same for our own health. You know, gut health now is, is pretty much, you know, accepted, I think. So yeah, soil is a habitat. These guys. They know what they're doing. Let's get them to do the work. Our job as gardeners should be to provide them with the habitat that allows them to do their job that they were invented and evolved to do. Thank you very much to Eddie for sharing his knowledge and enthusiasm. And thanks to you as well for listening. If you like this interview, I recommend checking out episode 149 
about the nutrient content of food and episode 129 with Nigel Palmer talking about naturally feeding your soil. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.